If you live in Columbus, Ohio, you have tried a plethora of products that the rest of the world has never had a chance to enjoy or loathe, depending on the quality of the offering. While other locations are used as well, Columbus has long been the number one choice for companies to use as a test market for new products as the demographics make it an ideal microcosm of the rest of the United States. Releasing products in test markets remains popular in fast food industries, but due to the extreme cost, how long it takes to properly test a new offering, and fear of competition purchasing and reverse engineering these products, many companies rely more on focus groups and limited releases than test markets. When a potential product fails the test and doesn't receive a widespread release, it often results in a bit of a cult following. Here are a few fan favorite items that never made it past test markets. While the McPizza did ultimately make it to as many as 500 McDonald's locations by 1991, that's a far cry from the 6,900 locations that existed in 1980 or the 37,000 that exist today. The company was doing great numbers with their breakfast offerings in the 1980s, but the dinnertime numbers weren't exactly what McDonald's wanted them to be. They wanted to try something different other than just burgers and fries that could attract whole families to come and enjoy dinner at McDonald's and so they came up with a McPizza. Originally, the pizza was served as a standard family-sized pizza that was brought to the table by waitstaff. Fancy. Cooking a whole pizza, though, takes time, so this was mostly eventually scaled down to personal-sized pizzas that could be cooked a lot faster. One of the earliest options even seemed to include McDonald's' own version of the Hot Pocket, a mini calzone that could be served easily through the drive through without the customer getting cheese all over their car. As far as taste is concerned, people generally like the pizza. While some called it a bit mediocre, the overall consensus seems to be that it was actually rather good, often being one of the best pizzas in town, depending on your location, of course. Keep in mind that this is also 40 years later, so most of the people still talking about it are going to be the ones that have fond nostalgia for the McPizza. So where did it all go wrong? If taste wasn't the issue, what prevented the McPizza from becoming a mainstay of the restaurant for decades to come? Now, there were two major issues. The first was the cost. At a time when a cheeseburger at McDonald's was 75 cents, a 14-inch cheese pizza was $5.80. That's basically the equivalent of seven cheeseburgers. There was also a delight Lux Pizza, which cost $9. It doesn't seem like a bad price by today's standards, of course, but in 1992, McDonald's ran its two for two dollars Big Mac campaign. One pizza or eight Big Macs is not exactly a very challenging decision. There was also the issue of time. The average wait time at McDonald's drive through is around 284 seconds or just under five minutes. This time it starts from the moment you pull into the line with five cars ahead of you to the moment you receive your food. This is incredibly fast, and the target time for each drive through order to be prepared is about 60 seconds. By contrast, the full-size McPizza took 11 minutes to cook. By fast food standards, you would have died of old age by the time your pizza came. Personal pizzas were much faster, taking only four minutes, but that's still a pretty long time, especially for all the people waiting behind you in the drive through While McDonald's eventually discontinued the McPizza, not all restaurants were ready to abandon the idea just yet. Franchise owner Greg Mills continued to sell the McPizza at two locations that he owned, one in Ohio and one in West Virginia, all the way until 2017. Locals of these restaurants were big fans, but as always, the internet had to ruin everything. The existence of these two locations started going viral, resulting in people driving hours to come and get a McPizza. Three friends from Canada filmed their 500-mile trip from Ontario to West Virginia just to try the pizza. Must have been an absolutely riveting documentary there. Unfortunately for Greg, all of this viral attention eventually made its way to McDonald's corporate headquarters. They brought the hammer down and demanded that he stop selling pizza. If anyone had been holding out hope that corporate would change course just to try and revive the McPizza, it seems that the company would like to put this part of their history behind them once and for all. What's the point of OK? Oh, what's the point of anything? This is an excerpt from the OK Soda manifesto that was printed on some of the cans. OK Soda was something quite remarkable. It was the dare of soft drink, something brilliantly cynical that was the most 1990s thing possibly ever made. Yet, by all accounts, it may actually have been quite ahead of its time. OK Soda was manufactured by Coca-Cola, something they were legally required to print but absolutely did not advertise. While later packaging designs describe it as a uniquely fruity soda, they also never advertised exactly 
exactly what it was supposed to taste like. Rumors circulated that OK stood for Orange Coke, but this obviously made no sense. It's a C, not a K. And also, it didn't taste orange. The product was never really about taste, though. It did taste good, apparently, but that wasn't the point. It was just all about the marketing. The marketing campaign was offbeat, featuring artwork from popular alternative cartoonists. Cartoonists Daniel Close modeled the OK Soda mascot on the facial features of Charles Manson on the basis that nothing he signed said, don't put a mass murderer on the can. His design was unchanged, so Coca-Cola must have agreed with his logic there, apparently, or no one looked into it very thoroughly. Besides, the marketing was meant to be subversive, so it's hard to argue that Close wasn't doing exactly what it was hired to do. The character may have shared some similar facial features, but without the hair and the beard, it also didn't really exude a Manson vibe anyway. The brand was also self-deprecating. It never promised to be great or good. It was simply okay, and some advertisements went so far as to compare the drink's taste to carbonated tree sap. The target audience was Generation X, possibly the first generation to truly understand from a young age that they were being targeted and manipulated by mass media and advertisements. Coca-Cola wanted to play into that and offer customers something slightly more honest. The drink never claimed to be the next big thing. It simply claimed that it was going to be okay. The taste and the product itself were entirely secondary to the feeling of okayness that they were trying to promote. Aside from their official slogan, things are going to be okay, there was also the manifesto mentioned earlier. While the first quote I mentioned is a bit nihilistic, their goal can be better summarized by one of the other statements in the manifesto. Please wake up every morning knowing that things are going to be okay. To that end, the soda had its own toll-free number, 1-800-I-FEEL-OK. Every day, the content on the number would change. There was a prompt of true or false questions inspired by the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, a personality and psychopathy test used by mental health professionals. While this may have been useful to collect demographic data, most likely it was just to help push people towards their own feeling of okayness. The much more exciting part of the phone number was that every day there were new stories about how OK Soda changed people's lives to be more okay. You could even record your own story of why you felt okay in the hopes that it would later be played for other people. Coca-Cola also used OK Soda to bring back its failed Magic Hand experiment. I actually made a video all about that on my other channel today I found out, which is called that time Coca-Cola spent $100 million intentionally filling its cans with fart water. So if you want to check that out, please do. But if you can't tell from the title of that video, the Magic Hand promotion didn't go very well. This time, however, they figured out how to do things right. The prize cans of OK Soda that can be found in vending machines were visibly distinct from normal cans, and the entire top of the can peeled off to reveal the prize inside. The prize was OK branded merchandise, usually a hat. Now, obviously, with a hat inside your beverage, you might still be feeling thirsty, but fear not, inside the can were also two shiny quarters, enough to purchase another can of actual soda from the vending machine. So, why did OK Soda fail? It was released in 1993, but discontinued in 1995, a relatively short short lifespan, even for a test product of the era. The short answer is that it failed to gain more than 3% of the market share in the test markets, but that's not the real answer. The cynical, self-deprecating, interactive and viral style of marketing the brand relied on was aimed at Generation X, those born in the 1970s and late 1960s. But the ones that it truly resonated with were those born in the 1980s. It's hard for your key demographic to vote with their wallets when they're all 13 years old or younger, and they don't have any money. Truly, OK Soda was ahead of its time. Their strange marketing was done a disservice by being produced in an essentially pre-internet age, and the people that would have made up its core demographic were too young. Had the product been created 10 or maybe even 5 years later, the internet would have allowed these ads to go viral, and the people the brand resonated with would have finally been old enough to have jobs and purchase the product on their own. How would you like to be able to go to Starbucks in the morning for a little hair of the dog? Well, too bad, because if your Starbucks location does sell alcohol, they're not going to do it in the morning. Not where I live. <laughs> in Europe, you can absolutely buy wine and beer in Starbucks whenever you want. <laughs> But the placebo effect is a real thing, so if you lived near a Starbucks test location in 2014 or 2015, the dark barrel latte may have been exactly what you needed to feel like you were having that refreshing morning beer before you head to work. The dark barrel latte was designed to taste like a stout beer, the type of beer that is known for tasting like coffee. So it was essentially coffee that tasted like beer 
that tasted like coffee, which makes it really hard to believe that their intended market for this product extended beyond the belly functional alcoholic crowd. The more technical description was that this was a latte with a few pumps of malty syrup akin to the earthy notes of a stout beer. The beverage was served hot or cold and came topped with whipped cream and caramel. Immediately out of the gates, the drink was met with mixed reviews at best. While a stout-flavored coffee may sound great to some, some bitter flavors were not in line with the normal Starbucks fare. A company known for seasonal favorites like the pumpkin spice latte or the limited-time unicorn frappuccino is unlikely to have a clientele that seeks out a whipped cream-topped Guinness in the morning. I'm feeling like an alcoholic right now, but I have no desire to have a unicorn frappuccino, but my desire to have one of these things? Fairly high! I'd try that! To truly understand the rationale behind this latte, it's important to consider what else Starbucks was doing at the time. Much like McDonald's and the McPizza, sales were great in the morning, but they dwindled later in the day. While they could have accepted that most people view coffee as a morning drink and just closed shop early to save on overhead, that's not how capitalism works. In 2010, they had started testing a Starbucks evening program that offered beer and wine at over 400 locations near their headquarters in Seattle. When the Dark Barrel Latte began testing in 2014, they had just announced plans to expand their evenings program to more stores across the country. With the exception of a few company-owned locations, alcohol at Starbucks went away in 2017, but these lattes didn't even make it a full year. Had everything gone according to plan, the Dark Barrel Latte was likely to serve as a bridge between beer and coffee for those that had only been a fan of one or the other previously. The drink may have been considered a major misstep overall, but it was not without its fans. Within days of Starbucks pulling the drink from menus, enthusiasts were already on the internet trying to figure out how to replicate the taste at home. The simplest way would have been to pour a bottle of Guinness into a glass and then cover it in whipped cream and caramel, but well, <laughs> that sounds disgusting, but these gastronomical purists were trying to keep alcohol removed from the equation. Ultimately, the drink itself was not a bad idea. Starbucks was just not the place for it. There are plenty of people who enjoy both coffee and stouts that would love a drink like this, but your typical Starbucks customer enjoys neither coffee nor stouts, opting for a flat white and a Pabst Blue Ribbon. So I really hope you found today's video interesting. I mentioned that today I found out video. You should check that out if you're uh, up for more stuff like this. And thank you for watching.